Hey everyone, welcome back to The Recycled Mom. Today, I'm doing a video that is mainly in response to a post that I had on my Facebook page, my personal Facebook page, really. And it is a post about a church here in Virginia, and um, the pastor of that church is being criminally charged. So I shared that article on my page and um, got a firestorm of comments. So um, I'm going to be talking to you about that. As I was thinking about it, I'm like, you know, I really have a lot to say about this, and we're starting to get, to get into, um, you know, liberties and um, religious freedom, and then I was starting to see things about um, comments from Christians, um, and it started to go into different areas, and I was just like, you know what, I just need to make a video. Um, so forgive me for maybe I'm going to be reading a lot, and some of it's going to be information from Liberty Council. Liberty Council is the um, um, attorney that is going to be um, defending this church that is in Chincoteague. Now, what happened was the police served a summons to the pastor of Lighthouse Fellowship in Chincoteague Island for holding their church service for 16 people spaced far apart in a sanctuary that seats 293 people. Now, our governor in Virginia um, has a executive order, number 55, that it has a penalty up to a year in jail and or a $2,500 fine. Now, um, this is what happened. Last Sunday, before the service, a local police officer entered the church. He gave no introduction and did not ask for the pastor. He abruptly said they could not have more than 10 people spaced six feet apart. Then, after the service, two police officers entered the church in full mask and gloves and asked to speak with the pastor. They issued Pastor Wilson a summons and informed him that if he had service on Easter, and if more than 10 people attended, everyone would receive the same summons. Now, I already have a couple problems with this because it looks like that there was already targeting of that church because um, before the service even started, the police officer came in, didn't announce himself, and gave an announcement and left. Um, I don't see anybody doing this in the grocery stores, okay? Grocery stores have everything. You know, they have things taped and blockaded, and they have your path all marked and announcements on the overhead speakers and all that stuff, but I don't see any policemen coming in and making sure that everything is okay and announcing that if you all are going to be more than X amount of people and you're not going to be spaced far enough apart and everything, that we're going to serve everyone's summons here. I don't see anybody doing that in grocery stores and home improvement stores when everybody crowds around together. So first of all, I have a problem with that. And second of all, I have a problem for um, the officer saying that everyone would receive the same summons. Um, for being in attendance, that's encroaching on an individual liberty for someone to be in attendance and, and worshiping. So now you're infringing on an individual right. So I have a problem with that. But again, I know I'm not a lawyer, but this is how I'm understanding the individual rights. This is what my comments were saying on Facebook. And from the comments on my Facebook page, it seems some people are assuming that I believe um, or am suggesting that churches are above the law or that I think churches are exempt from the law or that I am encouraging them to blatantly disobey the law. Okay, that is not the case at all. That's not what I'm saying. Not at all. What I am asking for, which is what I originally posted, I am asking for our governor to... to um, have an exception to this particular church case that I am talking about, this church in Chincoteague Island. I am asking that the pastor and the attendees to not be criminally charged or fined. To be clear, I do not encourage anyone at all to deliberately do anything that would endanger the community. That's wrong, okay? And I do not encourage anyone to violate their conscience. So for you, if you feel that opening your doors for worship services, say if you're a pastor if it, uh, doing that, or if you feel that going to church to worship God violates your conscience, then don't do it. That would be wrong for you. It would be wrong to violate your conscience. But don't judge someone else for opening the doors of their church and holding church services. 
The Liberty Council, Matt Staber, said Lighthouse Fellowship Church protected the health and safety of the 16 people by requiring them to be spread far apart in the 293-seat sanctuary. Again, 16 people, 293 seats. The church does not have internet. Some people do not have cars, and they depend on the ministry of the church for their physical and spiritual needs. But because the church had six more people than the 10 allowed by Governor Northam, the pastor is being criminally charged. Now, this church is also known in the community for um, helping people keep free of drug addiction, brokenness, mental illness, poverty, prostitution. All right? They have... Um, uh, they donate a lot of their time, um, resources for repairing and renovating houses. They cook meals. They help people to um, apply for disability. Um, the church offers a blanket ministry. They have a prayer ministry, discipleship programs, and counseling services. Again, there were only 16 people in attendance. They were the 16 people that needed to be there that didn't have anything that needed these things. And I, they are the most needy. And they were there, and the church was ministering to them in this time when people have nothing, you know. And so, again, that's why I'm asking our governor to have um, some leniency and flexibility in th this particular church. I'm not saying that churches, are, I'm not saying that this church is above the law, you know. Is there an, ex am I asking for this to be an exemption? Yes, I am, because I think that there needs to be flexibility. I don't. There is no one-size-fits-all um, in this stay-at-home order that we have. You know, when you have churches, that we have mega churches um, in our area, and when you have some, you know, churches that maybe only seat 50, well, you know, that's, you know, we, those churches can't meet. But then you have churches that seat like, you know, 500, 1,000, you know, they can certainly have 10 people, or they can certainly have more than 10 people. So... Um, I think that putting a, say, uh, a size limit on everybody's meetings is not good. And putting and saying that, that you can't be creative in your meetings and arresting people uh, for meeting outside in their cars, I think that's wrong too. There's, there's no flexibility. It's too rigid. But it's also infringing on our rights. Um, this is actually a guide from Liberty Council about knowing your rights in a state of emergency. Freedom of religion is not a privilege that is granted to me by the government, okay? It's unalienable to me, okay? It existed before government. It is God-given. It is a right. And as the Declaration of Independent States, governments are instituted in order to secure that right, okay? And the government must safeguard liberties you already possess, Guidelines for expanded government authority during an emergency, okay? Now, in general, the government can restrict certain rights by demonstrating a legitimate or compelling interest, okay? Now, the government must also have to use something called least restrictive means. In other words, if the, the government can accomplish it's compelling interest. We have a compelling interest. Everybody needs to stay at home so we can flatten the curve, okay? But if they can accomplish this goal in a less restrictive way, then it must do so. The restrictions should be narrowly tailored to meet the stated objective. And any restriction must not discriminate against religion. Now, the word emergency is not in the Constitution. The Constitution... Um, does mention situations of invasion, domestic violence, and war. Supreme Court martial law cases arose during times of war, and the Supreme Court has never been faced with martial law questions outside of war or rebellion. The challenge comes in upholding those the high standards of the least restrictive means and narrowly tailored requirements when the alleged emergency demands restrictions on constitutional rights. So what all of this means is that if there, again, if there is a least restrictive way to do something, then we need to do that. A constitutional problem arises when a size limitation is placed over different locations and types of meetings without any flexibility. So what I am asking from our governor 
and from fellow believers, fellow Christians who are demonizing the pastor of this church is to look beyond yourselves, look outside of the perspective of your own church experience and recognize that many churches serve their communities in a way that cannot be done online. There needs to be more flexibility and less restriction. Right now, many churches in the Commonwealth are cooperating, okay? But <laughs> uh, how much longer is that going to go? How much longer is that going to last? Um, we're probably a month into this or so, I think. Um, you know, right now, churches, you know, are communicating, are, are cooperating out of love and compassion and, you know, and respect because we, we love our people, we love our neighbors, and we want, you know, we certainly don't want to do anything that would jeopardize the health of anyone, and so, you know, we're cooperating. Everyone in the Commonwealth right now is cooperating, you know, and everyone, you know, to the best of their ability, I understand there's, you know, <laughs> idiots out there <laughs> that aren't cooperating so well, um, however, but, you know, pretty much everyone is, you know, I know in my community, a lot of people are, are cooperating, but I don't think it's going to go on much longer. People are getting restless. Many churches can meet online and that works for them. But for some, closing the doors and, and meeting online is actually hurting the people that need the ministries of the church. So I have some questions. How long should the church cooperate? How long should we cooperate? Do we actually have to cooperate? That, those are some things that we're going to be looking at. I am, have stated on my Facebook page and in my comments that I stand behind this pastor when it comes to challenging our federal, state, and local government authorities when they are overreaching in their laws or they're abusing their authority. If we don't challenge them and we stay silent, then we are just handing over our individual liberties. Now, it was somebody, I don't know if it was more than one person or not, but somebody was accusing of, um, you know, by opening your doors, this particular church opening its doors, they were disobeying the law and they were breaking the law. Technically, yes. Now, I used a speeding incident because when we go on I-81 in Virginia, I don't think there is a single soul in Virginia that drives the speed limit on 81. The speed limit is 70 in Virginia. I know I don't, and I can't imagine that, because there's people that go faster than me all the time. I set my, my um, cruise control at 75. Sometimes I do 78, just depending on what traffic is doing. You know, And so technically, I'm, I'm speeding and I'm breaking the law every time I get on the highway. I'm breaking the law, but I, that, does it bother me? No. <laughs> you know, and so I used that analogy in my uh, comments. You know, of course, nobody reacted to it at all. And I think everybody ignored it because I called them out. You know, we, that is breaking the law. So to sit there and tell me and to say that, you know, well, this church is breaking the law. They knew what they were doing. Well, yes, you know what you're doing every time you get on the highway. You know what you're doing. You're, you're breaking the law. But we have grace because really we don't get pulled over because there's that grace window. You know, but there's because of, of varying speedometers and stuff, you know, so we don't, we have um, this, this window of grace. So you can go about five miles over and not be um, speeding, you know, but you, you know, you're going to go 80, you're probably going to get pulled over and 80 miles an hour in Virginia. If you get pulled over and you're going 80, then that's reckless driving. So you will get a ticket and you will have to go to court. What, this is my example because I'm asking for leniency and I'm asking for grace for this church because they were six over the 10 in their church service. And that's why I'm doing that. And so why well, I'm saying that sometimes you have to break the law. Sometimes that um, actions speak louder than words in order, in order to get the attention of the powers that be. You have to break the law in order to get the attention. I'm not going to sit there and tell that pastor of his church, it's his church, it's not mine, I don't go there, but I'm certainly not going to tell him to sit down and shut up because that's his congregation, that's a totally different congregation. And that's his conscience, and I'm not going to tell him to violate his conscience by closing his doors. But I'm also, if, he, if he's willing to hold service for 16 people, I'm willing to stand behind him and, and stand up because he has a right to do that, because we have a right in Virginia, 
and by our Constitution that we have a right to assemble, peacefully assemble. And he followed all of the rules by having everyone um, spaced far apart. They were taking health precautions and they were doing so safely. So I don't see that the problem here is, yes, he was breaking the law as far as, far as breaking the, the, um, the order of um, more than 10. Was he grossly doing it? No. And so I'm asking for grace. Now, for myself, I'm speaking for myself, and this, this whole government order the, uh, and the whole executive order that we have, most states have, um, I, I am not willing to allow one person to, um, to have that unchecked discretion to write the church into or out of existence by that one word, essential. I am tired of hearing about what is essential and what is not essential. Right? And so I know that there's the Department of Homeland Security has um, a guide that says um, what is essential for um, in states of emergency, what is essential to keep the infrastructure going. Um, again, remember, emergency is not in the Constitution, okay? There's no invasion, there is no domestic violence, and there is no war. I'm not okay with them telling us what is essential as far as the church goes. Because I would argue that churches are very necessary. They are very essential to the mental and spiritual well-being of people. Okay, especially during this time when we have stay-at-home orders, we've been sheltered, we've been cooped up, domestic violence calls have increased, abuse calls have increased, people need mental help and they're looking for spiritual direction. They're looking for hope. You've taken all of their comforts away. You've told us when we can move, when we cannot move, what we can buy, what we cannot buy. You've you've and you've you've closed churches in the process and churches are the number one place that will help people in these areas. And instead, you're leaving the liquor stores and the cannabis stores open that, that are going to help people cope. Can I say that the church will help people cope too? Okay, can we give them a healthy coping mechanism rather than the liquor and the cannabis? And I'm not going to argue on whether those are healthy or not or whatever. Okay, that's a different thing. Can we just add the church in there too? We can come alongside and add that in for a coping mechanism because they do offer counseling and they offer, um, you know, they offer hope. Um, and can we offer the physical exercise and recreation and fellowship? Those are coping mechanisms too, okay? But those are extremely limited. In my area, the parks are practically closed. And I'm not talking about the facilities that you use in the park. There are limited trails that you can go on um, there's, there's limited activities that you can do in the park. And there's a couple places that are completely closed. And I don't get it. It's like they're closing outdoors. I am going to end this section of the video with a question for you. We'll answer it and we'll start in the discussion with the next video. I'm going to challenge you with this question. When is it justified for a citizen to act as his own legislator and decide that he will or won't obey a given law? When is it justified for a citizen to act as his own legislator and decide whether or not he will obey a given law? Catch you in the next video.